Tonight's episode is brought to you by all the clearance rack warriors of the world, survivalfeeling.com, and you, our listeners. VW bus, 60 horsepower, two-wheel drive, with all the ground clearance of a wiener dog. Have you seen a wiener dog here lately? What is up, all of you wayward souls, and welcome back yet again to the Wayward Stories podcast. Wayward Stories is the podcast where we tell your stories of adventure in the great outdoors. Yeah, you know, we're still telling my stories up to this point, but because I have not invested in advertising, y'all, advertising is expensive, dear God. But because I have not invested in advertising, we're doing this on a slow growth. We call it a slow burn. Um, Grassroots movement to grow. And on that note, hey, you know, tell your friends about the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe. Helps a lot. But anyway, um, we're here to tell stories. We're here to ultimately share the broader experience of us out there in the great outdoors, finding ourselves, finding each other, finding our tribe, so to speak, just getting out there and doing what we love and chasing that call in our heart to get out and find our passions and kind of live our life the way that we want to live our life. Most of us pretty caught up in the day to day and it takes some real effort to get out and go chase your passions. Um, this week, as you're listening, it is probably what? We're into mid-November as you're listening to this. We have wrapped up our spooky season last week. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. It did really well as far as downloads go. It did better than my normal topical podcast. Um, may have to look into producing a second show um, that's more in the line with that very last episode that you heard. Um, the different stories of things people ran into out there in the... Uh, great outdoors. Um, but you know, that's neither here nor there. And that's for down the road this week. We are back to a topical subject. Tonight's subject is going to be, um, I don't know. I feel like I may be endeavoring to alienate my entire listener base, but I hope that you will receive it within the intention that I am offering it to you. Um, but before we get to that, um, I talked about early on some of the early episodes. I talked about how I would shout out folks who came and did a review and put a review and a rating out there because it helped us so much. We got a couple more. Um, so I want to give a big shout out to SJS and Lars who both have left good reviews. Lars gave me four stars and I probably deserve four stars, but he said something really kind. Um, well to me, it was very meaningful and I took it as a huge compliment, but he finished his review by saying the kind of guy that will tell you what they're biting on. Any of you out there that are fishermen, I'm not going to break this down for everyone, but anyone out there that's a fisherman knows what he's saying. And it is a big compliment and I take it as such. A lot of people, when they figure out where the fish are biting and what they're fighting on, they keep that information selfishly all to themselves because they do not want to share the wealth. So I took what Lars said as him saying, essentially, this guy will tell you where the good places are. He'll tell you what's going on out there. He's all about sharing. He's all about sharing the wealth. And I hope that's how he intended it. And even if you didn't, Lars, that's how I took it. Anyway, I appreciate both of you, SJS and Lars, for leaving a review. And to the rest of you, please go rate, review, and subscribe. It helps out substantially. And I will shout you out if you so do. Um, Let's see. What are we going to talk about? Tonight's going to be an interesting episode. It is topical. And we're going to try to break down... Some walls, some mental barriers to getting outside. And I don't think this is made out of whole cloth because I've had several comments and I've had uh, conversations with, correspondences with different people who have mentioned some of their misgivings and hesitancies to get out there. And we're going to address many of those tonight. So in the broad scheme, we're basically just going to try to break down some perceived walls of the modern movement to get outside and I'm going to try to give you guys some uh, alternate points to consider and hopefully help to motivate you to get out there. Um, but I got something that's been on my mind first I want to talk about for just a few minutes and I do believe it fits into the broader context of tonight's show 
thematically. Um, but it is kind of a uh, more of a psychological topic. Um, but it's something that I noticed. Like, what, what did we do during spooky season? We talked about, you know, mythical creatures and critters and things out there and just lots of fun stuff. But, you know, we talked about monsters, so to speak. And in the last episode, we talked about some possibly very real monsters that lived out there in the world. And just in my own personal experience, this has been something that I've dealt with over the last several years to a great degree. And I just feel like it's something, you know, I need to put it out there. Some of y'all maybe need to hear this, maybe need a little bit of validation in your life. So I'm going to throw it out there. When I started this, the whole idea was based on, and this was way back when it was still the men who don't fit in. The idea was find yourself and be yourself without apology. That was it. That was the basis of everything I was trying to show the world. Look, you can be traumatized by crap and you can still live a great life after that. And, you know, go out there and find yourself and just be who you are without apology. Be weird. Be whatever it is that you are. And don't worry about what the haters are going to say. That was the concept. And I still believe that is one of the core pillars of what I'm trying to create here with this platform and this podcast and the YouTube channel. Um, And on that note, what I want to say is, Essentially, it does not matter how good of a person you are, truly, sincerely, you could be a saint and you will always be somebody's monster or you always can be at the very least. Maybe you won't always be, but you can always be assigned the role of a monster in someone's world and it doesn't have to have anything to do with who you are. It doesn't have anything to do with what you've done. It has everything to do with them and that they are assigning something to you. They need you to be that so that they can basically sleep with themselves at night. Basically, they've done something and they need to justify an action, a thought, a feeling, something. There are always people in this world. There are always going to be people that just don't like you. So why try to please other people with your actions, with what you do and don't do? It's a sucky experience to live life trying to be what other people want you to be because essentially you can never make everyone happy and you're probably never going to make happy the people that you're trying to please because you are not being true to yourself you're not truly being you so what i'm saying is just be yourself guys find out who you are be yourself go on a journey to figure out who you are you don't just have to like oh yeah i just need to be who i am like it's a journey for most people But start trying to figure that out and don't worry about what other people are going to think because even on our best days, the best amongst us are always going to have haters. We're going to be someone's monster, whether they did something horrible to us and they need to create a justification in their mind or they simply want what we have or want to be who we are or we have something that they're jealous of, then they're just not going to like us. Like, that's just the world. Like, honestly, guys who you are as a person and how good you are as a person really honestly does not correlate to whether people like you or not. So go out there and just be yourself. It's better to be hated as a monster being who you are, whether it's justified or not, than it is to pretend to be something that you are not. And um, yeah, that's all I really wanted to say about that is like, I see a lot of people who aren't living out the purpose that they want to in life or being who they truly are, seeking out their passions simply because they're trying to please people in their world. That's what I did. That's why it was a pillar of the foundation of the creation of this project that I'm doing right now is because I spent my whole life trying to cater to other people and trying to be what they wanted so that they would accept me. And in the end, I found out no matter how hard you try to please other people, no matter how much you try to be what they need, like if you're just not, you're just not. It's better to be true to yourself. And also it works as a great screener because this is one of the harsh things in life. And some people will never um, engage it just because they don't want to. They, it's hard. It's hard to engage. Um, I was kind of forced to. That's why I have this perspective. But like it works as a great screener. When you just start to be who you truly are, people are going to leave. There are people that are going to abort mission and see their way out of your life. And that can be very painful. Um, but like, honestly, do you understand what that means? That's why this is a great screener. It's like true family, true friends love you for whoever you are, not what you provide to them, not what you, um, are to them in their life. Like if you simply chasing a dream or 
recognizing something about yourself that's not necessarily politically in the part of the world you live in, or even quote unquote ethically, heavy emphasis on quote unquote, ethically considered the norm for your area, people are probably going to see their way out of your life. And those are not really the kind of people you want in your life anyway. So I just want to encourage everyone to not worry about appearances. Not worry about what the world thinks of us because it's going to choose to see us however it wants to see us. And the way to live your life is to be who you are, figure out who you are and be that. And the people that stick around and the people that find their way to you, that is going to be your true family, your true friends, and really the truest form of your life and what you want to be. So anyway, that just that almost seems really off topic. I mean, honestly, I guess you could consider it that it is, but it's really not because the bigger picture of this whole podcast is find yourself and be that. For me, it was going back to the wilderness and the things that I loved. And it just, that's kind of how this works in my mind. It's like me doing the podcast, doing the YouTube, doing all these things. This is one of the truest expressions of me as a creator, as someone who wants to share his experience with the world. So like anything you do, anything you love, anything that you're passionate about, whatever burns under your sternum that you care about, go and do that no matter what anyone thinks, because that's what's going to make you the happiest in life. And honestly, even if it's a tough start, once it smooths out, it'll be better in the end. I can promise you that from experience. So anyway, how does all of that fit into the topic of tonight's episode. Well, tonight's episode, I don't even know what to name it yet, honestly. But the whole concept is just breaking down some of the barriers, the mental mindsets to people wanting to get outside. This is an outdoor themed podcast, so we're going to focus on this. But you could really probably apply this metaphor and all the things we're going to talk about to anything you want to apply it to. It's more of a concept than it is a subject specific thing. But it's just like breaking down ideas and perceptions that are out there that are keeping some people I have found out from correspondence with them from wanting to get out there and do what they love to do. So yeah, as of the moment, I don't even know what we're going to call this, but we're going to get right into it. When it comes to the outdoor space, there's very much, it has a very, very, um, pretty uniformed look right now in the world because where do we get all of our information instagram facebook social media and it has an outward appearance of a pretty unified facade that if you're going to be a modern outdoors person so to speak you need a giant 50 or 60 thousand dollar jeep or a toyota forerunner um with all kinds of shiny gear and equipment all over it um you need a lot of name brand clothes and you need a really fancy camera to take lots of pictures and and put some kind of a fancy looking watermark on to get out there and enjoy the great outdoors like and fit in that's that's kind of the idea if you want to fit in that's what the current movement looks like and what i want to do tonight is break down that perception and it is a true perception i've had several people talking to me someone said to me very recently like I've been listening to your show. I've been watching all your YouTube videos on your channel and all the adventures you go on. And like, I'm with it, man. I want to go do that. I want to get out. I've always wanted to do that. But life and marriage and children and all these things kept me from being able to explore that part of my experience in life. And now I want to do it. And I think I can do it, but I'm going to get out there and I'm going to look like an idiot. That broke a part of my brain. Because, now I better put it broke a part of my soul, because there's somebody that feels like they cannot get out there and be themselves and try to explore to find themselves because of a perception. Where did the perception come from? From what they see on the interwebs. That's, that's it. And it is different than it used to be. But that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to go through several 
individual things and talk about them specifically. That's what I said earlier. I may be endeavoring to alienate my entire audience tonight because maybe my entire audience tonight is people in awesome freaking forerunners that are out there every weekend with $50,000 teardrop campers that are set and rigged for outdoor adventure with their own suspension. And it's crazy. It's crazy. But what I want to tell you right up front, the concept is this. It takes none of that to go out there and explore. And I mean, really explore. And I'll be honest with you guys. A lot of those people that have all of those things don't even really get out there and really get back and do it. A lot of those people, not all, no blanket statements here, but a whole lot of those people, they're not out there on three, four day overnight hikes, you know, in the back country, trying to figure out how to pack enough food or calories, forget food, trying to pack enough calories and water and live what it takes to do a three or four day hike or a three or four day float trip, you know, staying on the river. Most of those guys, okay, not most, a lot of them are not even doing that. That's what I want you to understand. So much of it is image guys. What you're seeing on the social media is an image that people are wanting to portray. Okay. They're wanting to be a part of this new kind of fad, this new movement, this new click, because it looks awesome. And I'm not denying that. It does look awesome. Like, oh my God, y'all, I want a forerunner and have for like at least four or five years now. I want a forerunner so bad that my spleen hurts. It is a desire that I have, but I cannot afford one. I can't afford one. And what I do have, my Nissan Xterra, which is a cult status object all its own now since they quit making them. Nissan, listen to me, y'all, bring it back. But don't jack it up. Bring it back with the same concepts in mind. A true four-wheel drive frame, a true truck frame. Like, no frills, no bells, no whistles. Just get you there and get you back for a reasonable price. My Xterra is every bit, every bit as capable as a forerunner. And y'all, there's some four wheel drives that are real hot right now that people are buying. Like there's the whole Subaru club thing. Um, we're going to talk about that later, but you need to understand there's only a couple of real true four wheel drive SUVs out there right now that are sincerely outfitted from the factory to manage the kind of terrain you want to take it on. All I'm saying is Subaru, you make a sexy ass car. I really dig some of those, especially that new Outback Wilderness. God, I'd like to have one of those. They're awesome in the gas mileage. But, but guys, do not do the things you see that car do on the commercials. If you bought one, don't go do that. That car's not going to last you for four or five months before you are doing major, super expensive work to the suspension and the things underneath that car. They're great dirt road cars. They're great for a few little mud holes here and there. They are four wheel drive, but if you really get onto some really rough roads where you're really trying to climb your way back to, I'm not talking rock crawling. I'm talking just getting on some really good old forestry roads that have kind of got washouts in them that you can do in a real true four, you know, four wheel drive specific vehicle. You're not going to be able to do in that car. And if you do, it's going to start getting expensive really, really fast. And I'm not talking about upgrades. To make it happen, I'm talking about all the crap you broke because they're not designed for that. That is a fact. But anyway, we're not going to do cars yet. I probably should since I've just talked through half the talking points, but we'll we'll go ahead and get there later. Um, right out of the gate, I'm going to talk about this because I decided recently, I mean, this is like a great example. This is a perfect example. I decided recently I wanted to get into biking. Um not road biking and also not true mountain biking. Like this is a know your limits type of area. I am getting older. I will be 41 um, in two weeks, roughly. And I have from an early age had very severe knee and ankle problems. I played baseball from the time I was four years old until, I mean, God, I was still playing like church league ball at 27 or 28. And I caught for all of those years and my knees and my ankles, They do things. I mentioned it in a previous episode. They literally will dislocate. I can just dislocate one. It just pop out of place and pops itself right back in and it hurts like hell, but I'm kind of no worse for the wear as far as being able to walk around and do stuff. But I know my limits. I have certain limitations from the waist down with my ankles and my knees. I'm not going to go out there and shred on a mountain bike. 
that would not be safe for me. Whistler, not my bag. Would love to see it. Probably will go someday and find a way to experience in my own way. But not going to happen shredding on a mountain bike because my daughter needs me more than I need to be dead. And I know me and I would end up dead. And that's not bagging on you guys out there that are really, really doing it. Not at all. That's respecting you. You guys are doing some crazy crap. Crap I would never do. And you are good at it. You guys are more than fit, more than capable. Well, a lot of you, some of y'all getting hurt. Y'all know your limits, but you guys are great at what you do. And I think it's awesome. I love watching those videos, but it's not for me. I know that I'm not physically capable and strong enough to do that without risking serious injury. So it's not for me, but I do a lot of hiking. Why do I hike so much? It's because I, well, A, I love to be outside, but B, more than anything, what truly drives my soul is I want to explore. I want to see things I've never seen. I want to explore new area, areas and see new things. And back in the backcountry, there's so much there, man. Like it, to me, like it is so exciting when I'm on a hike somewhere and I've gone way back into a new area I've never seen. Is it still just trees? Is it still just grass? Yes, it is. But sometimes you find that one canyon or that one waterfall that it's not on the internet. You don't see it in any of the books. You don't see it in any of the forums. It's just like a waterfall and a drainage or an old abandoned homestead from the 1800s, the 1850s. Like that is like you're out there exploring and you're just finding fun, neat, exciting things, things that for me interest me. And what it dawned on me was these guys on bicycles, especially after I was introduced to rail trails up in Indiana, and they're around here too. I'm not saying that that's like a Midwest specific thing, but they have a bunch. They have a bunch there for multiple historical reasons, but there are tons and tons of rail trails. And I was kind of introduced to those. And one day on the nickel plate trail, In Peru, Indiana, on a day that I was like, I think I was, no, I was off that day. I accidentally hiked 22 miles because I took off walking and suddenly I'd walked 11 miles. Like a couple hours later, three hours later, I was like, oh crap, I have to turn around. Like I have to get back before dark. I hiked 22 miles that day. And that's when it started to dawn on me. What could I have done on a bicycle? Rail trails are by their nature on a very slight grade, never more than normally a 2% grade, except for in extreme situations, because trains had to pull, you know, freight trains across them. And there's a lot of force and effort and horsepower and things involved in that. So they're on fairly flat grades. So you can go a long ways and see a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of obstructions on the trail and they go way back into places you'd never think you would even get access to. Um, And it dawned on me, man, like these things are, they're made. They're for biking, people on bikes all over them. How much more ground could I cover on a bicycle? But I don't want a road bike because I don't want to go biking roads. That's not really for me. I don't want to get run over. I don't want to fight traffic. Props to you guys, whatever. But like for me, I'm more of a middle ground. It's more of like a, what would you call it? A compromise for me. I want my bicycle to be off-road, so to speak. I want it to be a mountain bike, but... I don't want it. I don't need it. That's a better way to put it. I do not need it. Kit it out with all kinds of crazy suspension and all kinds of crazy, you know, overbuilt pedals and all the things you need to stay safe. If you're going to go truly mountain biking, like really ripping it, I don't need all of that. And all that stuff is really, really expensive. Okay. To go into those kinds of upgrades and to buy even bicycles that are into the kind of frames that you quote unquote need for that. But I don't want a road bike because the wheels are too thin. The tires are too small. Like I want to be able to go on trails. I want to be able to ride on gravel trails. It's a lot of rail trails. So it's kind of more just like a a middle of the road, all terrain type of bicycle is more what I'm after. Right. But I start looking into bikes and here's one of the first walls you might run into that could keep you from getting outside is the paywall, the perceived paywall. We addressed this on the Explore More episode several episodes back about how to, say, travel more cheaply, how to find the places that you want to go to do the things you want to do. But we didn't address how expensive gear is. And that's kind of what we're going to look at right here. There is a paywall and it's a real paywall to getting into the kind of gear to do some of the hobbies you want to do. However, that said, it is more of a wall by perception than it 
is as it truly exists. Like it seems like it can be the Great Wall of China when really it is, it's just a barbed wire fence and you need to try to squeeze between the wires without scratching your back. It's more of a perception. And this bicycle story here is a great, great, great example. And that's why I'm gonna tear into it right here because I decided I wanted a bike, thought about it, started looking into it. And I pull up, you know, because I am a full fledged believer in you get what you pay for. 100% believe in that. But that's within reason. That's within reason. It's been my experience in life that if you buy the cheapest of the cheap, no offense, Walmart, but if you go to Walmart and you buy a Huffy bicycle, you're going to get a Huffy bicycle and it's going to be garbage doing what you want to do with it within a few months. Because hell, that's what they were when I was a kid growing up. And I was a kid not doing the things that I want to do with it now. And I could destroy that bicycle. No problem. Just riding around town. Right. But you need to pay. Okay. Let's put it this way. But the very high end, you don't really need that either. The high end is usually so overpriced because it's a name and it's a name people want to associate themselves with because if they ride X bicycle, let's say a specialized bike, then they are a part of that echelon. They are a part of that club and that bike alone specialized right there down the frame tells everyone in the world. Now that dude's for real. That girl's for real. She really bikes. That is a perceived perception and that's not knocking specialized either. Specialized makes great stuff. Guys, I actually delivered to specialized world headquarters in Morgan Hill, California when I was delivering out there. I did not like them. They were not the nicest receiving people I've ever dealt with. But they did have some really cool hearses in their back lot where I had to deliver. They had some really cool hearses and I think a bus that was just totally tricked out to, uh, you know, be for PR events and things like that. And they make great bicycles. They absolutely do. How Ever they are incredibly overpriced because the name on the side says specialized and people want to associate themselves with that. It's supply and demand. If people really, really want it and they're willing to pay anything for it, then you can charge anything for it. And that's how it works. So first thing I learned, found my way into the perceived paywall of the bicycle world and started going, well, I know how the rest of things work. Somewhere in the middle is a great good quality brand or brands that are competitors that cost half the price, but have every bit as much quality and dependability. Um, and so I started looking into that and sure enough, I found that, um, there are several brands. What I really got hung on was going to, I was wanting to get a Trek and I was thinking like a Marlin six or a seven, but I'm in at 800 to a thousand dollars there, which is more than I really wanted to be in. That's still a very significant amount of money, right? Half of a specialized, which specialized has some lower end models too. Don't get me wrong, but that was like, I was like, okay, this bike, I think the six, I believe it was the seven was the one I was like, I think that's really going to fit what I'm wanting to do. The ability to go off trail, but not have all the bells and whistles and all the, the stuff that makes it really, 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 truly expensive. Um, but be more than enough for my purposes and what I need. And it's not a road bike. It was a nice in-between bike. It's kind of like a crossover, let's say. Um, but as I looked at that, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be in good minimum 800 close to a thousand for this. And then I'm gonna have to have a three or $400 bike rack to attach to my vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, this is still really expensive, but I was determined I was going to make it happen. I just wasn't sure how soon or when, right? You know, finances, life bills, important things. But I got to looking into it and I was like, you know what? There is this awesome black market called Facebook marketplace. So I started looking into Facebook marketplace and started looking for used variants of this very specific Marlin seven. And I started looking at other brands and I started looking into all my, my options. I was in no real hurry, right? I didn't have to have it for this weekend. So I'm going to buy whatever I can find and willing to pay anything for it. This was more of a long term idea. So I started looking into Facebook marketplace and came across several bikes and eventually actually found and settled on what I ended up with was a Trek brand, a few years old. I think it's like a 2015 or a 2014. Um, and I don't even remember the model to be completely honest with you, but I found it for $200. Guy claimed to be getting out of biking because he had a serious wreck and punctured, punctured a lung and thought that he would just stick to his kayak. Now those stories, you have to take them with a grain of salt. I kind of believe this guy meant it, but... It was a nice older Trek bike. It's Trek. 
It's a good quality. It's a name brand that is trusted and known. And it was kitted out for off-road mountain biking. It had lots of upgrades. 200 bucks is what this guy wanted for it because it was older, because it had wear and tear. And I had to drive for it, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second, taking advantage of opportunities here. So I picked up this bike for 200 bucks. So I'm like, you know what? I've got to have a bike rack. So I started looking for a bike rack, right? Come across a bike rack, a nice Thule bike rack. I mean, it's a $429 MSRP. This thing's like brand new. And the guy's got it listed. And it says essentially, asterisk, slightly defective. And then a question mark, or maybe I just don't know how to use this properly. This guy had an issue with this specialized bike rack, or not specialized, uh, Thule bike rack. He sends it into, it's a Helium 2, actually. He talks to Thule about it, and they just send him a new one. But what he had was it was bouncing off of its cradle, but it was staying on the rack because the little straps you put over it were holding it on. And he didn't like the fact that his bike was bouncing loose. He probably had a $3,000 bike, and I wouldn't like that either. But I was like, when I saw slightly defective, I thought, I've lived so much life the hard way. I promise you, that is not a complicated piece of machinery. It's a couple of arms, a couple of little widgets here and there. I promise you. For $329 less than its list price, I promise you slightly defective is something I can deal with and almost 100% bet you my wallet, I can fix it. I will find a way to fix it. Exactly what happened. Actually, the issue he had was, and guy, if you ever listen to this, man, I hate that you had to find out this way. But again, Tule sent you one for free. So what's it matter? You, you came out $100 better off. But like those straps are rubber and they are stretchy. And all you had to do was put a little umph into it the way they were designed to strap it tight to the thing. You couldn't just like loop it over it. The bike was bumped. It's not going to cradle on its own. It's meant to be cinched down. And that's all the guy did is he didn't cinch it down. And I had one other issue that I had to deal with. It was a one and a quarter hitch rack, like hitch tube. That doesn't make sense. I ain't know about that. That's like hitch hitches for cars like any vehicle I've ever owned in my life I had a lawn care business all kinds of stuff two inch rack standard for normal size or even mid-size pickup truck all I had to do $15 part go down to U-Haul found a $15 one two inch to one and a quarter inch reducer hitch receiver and I had a 300 or a $429 brand new Tule helium 2 for $117 and like 16 cents total had to figure in that I had to go pick it up. I bought it from out of area, but that's what I was going to mention a while ago. Y'all I just saved. Okay. I got the bike for 200 found the bike rack in the same area for another hundred. So I'm in $300 for something. I was going to be in $1,300. So I've just like came out a thousand dollars, 800 to a thousand dollars better shape. Right? So what did I do? It was worth it. I'm willing to drive tank of gas. So I had a tank of gas to it. And what did I do? I found a place to stay close to where they were and did an awesome, uh, rail to trail line while I was there and actually took a day for myself and just had me a little trip for under what would it cost me to stay? Anyway, I'm under a hundred dollars for the trip down gas, staying everything. So I took advantage of that and I'm into this bicycle. If you count the trip to pick it up and the fact that I chose to just stay the night down there, and go have some fun on the bike. I'm into the bike less than like $400. And it's a good quality bike. I already went and got it checked out, you know, just to see. And the guys at the bike shop were like, yeah, bro, dude, you got a steal on this thing. This is great. It's mechanically sound. Everything's, they got to do a little tune up. There's a little bit. I'm going to probably spend $50 on the tune up. But the point is, is I got into a new hobby that I've talked about even here on the podcast a while back saying, I may get into this. I got into a new hobby by being, um, you know, a clearance track warrior, by being a bargain shopper and getting out there and looking and overcame that paywall at a very significantly reduced rate and got a really good quality item to get out there and do the job. And guess what? Super bonus. If I gave a crap about what people thought about me, it still says track on the side of it so I can fit in with the big boys club, but I also don't give a crap what people think about me. So that makes a difference. But point is for any of you that it really does matter to, and you don't, you, it, I mean, and I'm not bagging on anyone. Do not get me wrong. I will never bag on anyone who has any kind of social anxiety issues where like me, I kind of grew up like that. I just want to fly under the radar. 
I've often wanted name brand stuff, not because I wanted the name brand, because I simply wanted to quote unquote fit in, not because I wanted to be cool like everyone, but because I just wanted to fly under the radar. I just want to blend in. I didn't necessarily want to fit in. I like to blend in. I don't like to stand out in a crowd. I'm a t-shirt and jeans guy. I don't know if you've noticed from watching this show, I wear a lot of dark colored clothes. I don't go out there in like loud colored shirts. I just don't really like attention. I like to blend in. So for any of you out there that have any of those kinds of thoughts in your mind, and it's important to you to be able to blend in and not stand out in a crowd, you can even get good name brand stuff where you will kind of just blend right in with the crowd if you know where to look and you get a little bit creative about it. And it's not that hard. Like coming up with this bike was a super win for me. It was a big time super win. And I got into it and broke down the barrier of that paywall, but I knew where to look and I knew how to look. And you know, that's why I'm telling this story to you tonight is I want you guys to understand the paywall is far more of a perception than it is a reality. You just have to, I don't know, maybe you just needed to, that to be pointed out to you because I know it was for me. It's kind of a lifelong process of getting into things like that. So anyway, um, we've run on well past our half hour now, so let's go ahead and take our commercial break for the night and we'll come back with a couple of other things I want to address along this same thematic. We'll be right back. I want to take a second to tell you guys about tonight's sponsor, Survival Feeling. Survival Feeling is a hiking brand based in Greece, and they offer an assortment of gear that's aimed towards the goal of helping you better enjoy your time outside. And that is, of course, what we are all about here at Wayward Stories. I really like this company for a lot of reasons, but chief amongst them is that they were founded with giving back to the community in mind. They donate a portion of all proceeds to organizations like the Wildland Firefighters Foundation to help support those who work to keep us all safe while we're out there trying to find ourselves. We've partnered with them to bring you guys a unique coupon code that will save you wayward souls 15% off of your order. Go to survivalfeeling.com and use offer code waywardstories at checkout. Once again, that's survivalfeeling.com and use the offer code Wayward Stories. And welcome back. Thank you guys for sticking around through the commercial break. Super important for us um, to have those in there. Um, but let's just get right back into it. And let's go ahead and talk about cars. Like we started on vehicles earlier and I kind of went a little bit too far into it. But let's talk about it now in a little bit more detail. Right up front, the Proviso, the uh, um, the asterisk, the disclaimer is, I get this is a highly contentious subject. Well, you know, we all use dinner webs and everything's contentious now, but this particularly throughout time, man, you want to talk about some brand loyal people get into vehicles. Um, understand that everything I'm saying here is obviously my opinion. And I know it's just an opinion. I do like to base my opinions on facts and research that I can do and information that I can find. I actually talk to a couple of people specifically that I know who specialize in particular brands, um, like particularly Subaru, um, and Jeep. I talked to some people that I know personally, and, you know, kind of hashed out some details to really get a feel for what I wanted to present to you guys tonight. But, what we're going to break down here is this is more of a perception wall. And I'm going to say some things about vehicles in particular that a whole lot of you, I mean, this might be the one that alienates my entire listener base. A lot of you are not going to like what I have to say, but just understand that that's also within the realm of understanding that you can still make it work. I just want people who have a perception of, I don't have the right kind of car to get outside. I don't have the right way to carry things. I don't have the right vehicle I need to really take me out there and explore. And that's expensive. They're really expensive. Yeah, the heck they are. But that's also a perception. You don't have to have those things to get out there. When it comes to vehicles particular, like, let's think about this. When it comes to the American outdoors person, where do you really, where's your mindset really go? Honestly, most people's, if you think about it, probably goes back to perceptions from like the 1950s and 60s. Yeah, we can go way back. You know, we can get into the people like the um, Ansel Adams and the and the John Muirs and the all those things. Yeah, but that's not really what comes to people's mind when they think about getting outside. A lot of it really comes from the 1950s, the 60s, the 70s, and kind of the flower power, the, the flower children of that decade, the tree huggers like that. 
is kind of what people perceive of people getting out and starting to explore and embrace and love nature and try to take it seriously and treat it with respect and reverence. That's more of what comes to mind. And what vehicle is more iconic for the flower power movement than a VW bus? Guys, a lot of the things, endless summer, come on, the things that we think about when we think about that free spirit of adventure that so many of us, I think, resonates with us to get outside. It came from a time where the VW bus was like the ubiquitous, the iconic vehicle to get out there. And people did it. That bus went places. My God, for older generation that lived through that era, they loved those buses. My mom particularly loved the actual bug itself, but VW had a thing going back then. And that bus, it is synonymous, so to speak, with the tree huggers and the people who went out and really kind of brought back this surge of outdoors persons. And I get that I'm I'm not trying to make two on things like things like. Some of you might be thinking that. I'm not trying to make two unlike things like. What I'm saying is there wasn't really a group of people that were outdoors persons other than the hippies, except for the old middle-aged white men who were either hunters or they were the guys that lived in those stuffy gun clubs or like the, the lodges that they would have out in the middle of nowhere. And that has its own nostalgic kind of point of view, but that's not who you think of. What we're doing today and the movement that exists today really kind of had its genesis in that flower power movement. And it was the VW bus. Y'all, VW bus, 60 horsepower, two-wheel drive with all the ground clearance of a short weenie dog. Like, those buses were not built to get back there, but they did. They went wherever the heck they wanted to in those buses. I do believe when they converted over to a front-wheel drive, that helped tremendously, but they were not four-wheel drive vehicles. And before you write emails, I know there were some prototypes, but they were just prototypes. Like the public at large, those buses you saw out there with the people in the body paint and the hugging trees and the doing their thing out there, communing with nature, man, that was done primarily in VW buses, two-wheel drive very little, if any, ground clearance. Man, their center of gravity so, was so low. Do you know how hard it would be to roll a VW bus? Um, But my point is, right there, perception wall. Break it down. People did it in VW buses. If you're looking at Instagram, which is where most of you are looking at things, some of you will be looking in, say, Facebook. Um, Very few people Twitter. Twitter just doesn't have a huge outdoor thing going there. It's really Instagram right now. Instagram's the big one. If you look at it, it's people with pictures of their freaking literal $50,000 forerunner with $10,000 worth of wheels and suspension upgrades and a $5,000 Overland rig on top. And we're going to talk about Overland stuff next. We're really going to bust down some perception walls there. Um, and you think, man, these guys, they go way back there. They're really getting into it. They could in that particular vehicle, the forerunner, and they might be, but most of them are not. And you don't have to with that. You don't have to have that to go to the places you want to go. Um, For example, like I said, I drive an Xterra because it is an economical version. I mean, it and the 4Runner really are kind of the top of the field for SUVs. As far as crossover SUV, four-wheel drive type of vehicles. They're built on truck frames. They are truly come from the factory with the suspension, the frame, and the ground clearance necessary to get out there and do a little bit more extreme off-roading. And I'm not talking rock crawling. You've got to get into a whole different realm that's all specialized modifications for that kind of stuff. We're talking about families and, and people like us that are really trying to go back as far as they can go to do camping, to do hiking, to do photography, to go bicycling, to go waterfalling, whatever. Forerunners, Xterra is built on good frames for it with good suspension right out of the factory. My Xterra, they don't make them anymore. First of all, know that, but they don't make them anymore. But if you can find one with relatively low mileage, I think 2015 was the last model year. So if you come across one that's got 70 or 80 or 90,000 miles on it, that's a low mileage Xterra. And it's going to cost you sixteen dollars or $18,000. And it is an incredible vehicle with an incredible engine as far as reliability and these engines go forever i bought mine for like 16.5 with 72,000 miles on it a couple of years ago 
guys, that's a whole hell of a lot less than 35 to 40 for the same amount of money put into a forerunner. Used forerunner, 80, 90,000 miles, you're still paying 30 grand. You're still paying 35 grand. And I'm not knocking forerunners. I'd love to have one. I'd love to have one. But it's prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. And what I'm trying to explain here is that you can get the same capabilities out of other vehicles. Now, let's break down another perception. You don't have to have an Xterra or a Forerunner or anything else to get out there. You can get down a lot of the roads to a lot of the really, really great hiking trails here in Arkansas in a two-wheel drive friggin' Nissan Maxima. Like, you can do it. You know, your tires might not be super equipped for it. You might might wear them out a little faster and you might pop a hole in there, watch those sidewalls. But you can do it on a lot of these trails. You can get out there in two-wheel drive vehicles, and I see it every time I go hiking. I go to a particularly popular spot you'll see a lot of vehicles out there and you'll see a lot with bikes that have like literally a $40 trunk mount um bicycle holder and it works it's like a 40 or 50 dollar trunk mount bicycle holder on a two-wheel drive vehicle down off some trail you're like man it was kind of rough getting in here but they got in here not great for your car not great for your car but you can do it it's simply a perception and those people much like me they give no f's about whether when they pull up and that awesome forerunner pulls up next to them, if they're looking down on them, they don't care because they're not there, guys, for the perception. They're not there for the image. They are there because they want to go and explore these beautiful Ozarks we have in Arkansas. And this is true the world over. The people that are going and doing and making do with what they have available just to get out there, man, those are the true true believers in the wayward spirit, guys. Those are the ones that are out there no matter what it takes to get out there because that's where their heart is. That's where their passion is. So when you think about the vehicles, here's like, here's where I'm going to alienate everyone. Man, I see like, I think I, even my cousins, I think someone said they joined the Subaru club. Subies are awesome. We're awesome. No, not as much anymore, but they were. Subies got a huge fan base, a huge following, and Subies are cool. Like, I like Subies. Like I said earlier, that new Wilderness Edition, Outback Wilderness Edition, that is a sexy ride, y'all. That is a seriously sexy looking ride. I, if I could own two vehicles, I would probably own one for more like cross country adventures. They are four wheel drive, they do have a little bit more ground clearance than your standard vehicle. But, but, but here's the thing, even used ones right now, and this is of um, the end of October, no, this is mid-November 2021, right? Are we in 2021? We are. Yeah, because last year, the great TP shortage was in 2020, and that was last year. Um, They're like 30 to 35 used, much like a 4Runner, and a whole hell of a lot less vehicle than a 4Runner. Believe that. They're a lot less vehicle than a forerunner if you want four wheel drive capability. They're built on essentially car frames. Like they're not made for it, guys. That's an important factor. But they are four wheel drive. They have a little bit more ground clearance. And if you get a good all terrain tire, just like I just mentioned, there's people out there in two wheel drive Maximas making it work. A, 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 a Subaru is going to make it work a little bit better than even that. You do have a little more capability in that. They're cool little cars. I understand them to be pretty great little cars. At least they used to be. I'm not sure about the current quality. I've heard mixed reviews about current quality um, from a guy that specialized in Subarus. He was like, mm, not so much anymore. But my point is, they're cool little cars, but they're $35,000 used cool little cars when there are other options out there. There are other options to get you out there. You don't have to have the Subi with all the stickers on the window to be cool and fit in to get yourself out there. It is not a, ne a necessity. It is not necessary to do it. Um, and all of that said, I love those Subarus. They are cool. And the gas mileage, like I said, I love Forerunners. And I actually still want a Forerunner because it has a somewhat larger amount of space in the trunk area, in the cargo area rather, than my Xterra does. But I, I don't know. I'm in love with my Xterra. I may keep it forever, even when I do get another vehicle. I freaking love that ride. But you don't have to buy a thirty or $40,000 ride. I mean, and let's not get into Jeeps because that really will alienate the whole world. But Jeep quality 
this is factual. It's nowhere near what it was 20 years ago. Like they have had tons of recalls and tons of problems over the years, but Jeep's making a sexy vehicle. Like a lot of their new, like their Trailhawks, those are kind of like the, the wilderness, the Outback Wilderness in my example. They're sexy little cars, but they're the same thing. They have a little bit more ground clearance. They are four wheel drive, but the components are not built for extended off-road use at all. Um, and you're paying a whole lot of money for a name, for an image, and you could pay a lot less and do something that will still get you there is all I'm saying. And if you can't even, you know, non people aren't going to be like, I got to buy a car to get out there. I do know people that will do that, but most people aren't going to be like that. You can make whatever you have work. If you want to go biking, there are things, racks that you can put on trunks of cars. And I see it all the time out there and nobody bats an eye. You're not going to look like an idiot if you go out like that. Um, for anyone that's concerned about that, um, it's important to me to point all of this out. I feel like because I've had several people with comments about, you know, because that's what I hear all the time is I love the ideas. I love everything you're telling me. But here's all the reasons it doesn't work for me. And this was one of the main themes that's come forward is people afraid they're going to look out of place and look stupid like they're posers or trying to fit into a world they don't fit into or that they simply can't afford to. And that's why we're addressing it tonight. You're not going to look like an idiot out there in whatever you can get there in. Um, and there are price. Mm, what's the word? Economically feasible options that are not what the image of going outside now is. There's always a middle ground. There's always a way to make it happen. So on that note, let's talk about, because we were talking about vehicles, let's go right over into this overland rig idea. Somebody I talked to maybe about a year ago now, no, it's not quite a year ago, um, that I met at a search and rescue conference. She was talking to me about, you know, going out, getting out, and she hikes and backpacks and does all these things. And one of the things she asked me was like, so do you have an overland rig? And I was like, I need to know what an overland rig is. I've seen them, but I don't even know what one is. So I got to looking into it. Good God almighty. We're talking anywhere from a used quote unquote overland um, type of camping setup for your vehicle um, from like $1,500 all the way up into the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I was like, well, what, okay, what's special about this? I see people are doing it and it looks awesome. It looks amazing. Friggin' some of these forerunners with a, big old like kitted out for overland and off-road they look awesome but like the perception wall i'm here to break down is unfortunately you don't need any of that to do what they're doing because okay overland rig specifically there's really only two things that i can discern that i would say are required to define it as an overland rig four-wheel drive because the whole idea is getting back further than anyone else can get going over land, overland, and something to camp in. A four-wheel drive that you can camp out of. That's an overland rig. Guys, people are spending five, eight, ten grand to kit things out to be overland. Where the truth is, when I got back to her, I was like, yeah, yeah, I've got an overland rig. I have a hammock and my Xterra is four-wheel drive. I have an overland rig. By definition, the ability to camp and be self-sufficient out of a vehicle that can take you overland. That's an overland rig. So let's break down that perception right here. That stuff looks amazing. I mean, I'm telling you guys, it makes my spleen hurt that I want one so bad. But the reality of the situation is, is I already have one. It just doesn't look the part. It is not the image. Again, people were overlanding, so to speak, in a way, in VW buses in the 1960s, in the 1970s. And again, the ground clearance of a wiener dog. Have you seen a wiener dog here lately? I'm going to do you a favor and tell you to continue this podcast. If you're not driving, you need to stop right now and Google a wiener dog. Because it's going to make your day brighter just looking at a wiener dog. Just to remember how little ground clearance a wiener dog has. Check it out. My point is, an overland rig, by definition, is literally simply a way to camp and be self-sufficient out of a vehicle over land, over a trail, over rough passes, places that are hard to go. you got a four-wheel drive and you've got a tent. I mean, I was surprised to find out that you can actually carry a tent in a car and actually put it out on the ground from the car. 
like they don't have to be on the roof of your four wheel drive. That's what makes Overland rigs look cool. People love them. People love them. And they look, they're great photo ops, man. And they make you look like you are the man. You are the woman. You are the backs backwoods person and you're about it but none of that's necessary and it is a it's an amount of money that turns my stomach but again you know this is the everyday podcast for the everyday joe and jane like this is for the rest of us that have jobs and can barely pay bills but still want to chase our passions that stuff is unreasonable for most of us most of us trying to get out there it's just not it's just not reasonable it's not something we can do in good conscience, if at all. So the reality is, understand, guys, if you've got a tent, if you've got a hammock, if you've got a way to sleep, a way to carry food, a four-wheel drive that is self-sufficient, like, and that may mean, you know, a little air pump, it may mean some slime for your tires. And by the way, don't use that stuff if you ever intend to attach it to patch a tire. It, it ruins your tire. Like, it's only good to get you out of there. And as long as it holds, um, but like, if you have a way to take care of getting yourself unstuck, if you have a way to take care of, you know, putting a little air in the tire, carry five gallons of fuel, whatever it is, if you just have a few little things and you have a way to camp out of that vehicle, four wheel drive, you've got an overland rig. i literally have an overland rig that I would challenge a lot of people with those super expensive rides. I would challenge them that I can overland just as far as you can, if not further, mine's smaller. Mine's more nimble. Mine can fit through tighter spaces. It's um, it's just my point is, again, not to alienate anyone because I want y'all to understand. I respect y'all's over, Overland rigs. They're awesome. And I would love to have one. But I need the rest of the world to understand that's not a pro- prohibition against you getting out there. That is not a prerequisite. It is not a requirement for you to get outside. Not even close. It is simply super fancy stuff that's a lot of fun. They're fun toys. Getting outside, gearheads, love it. We get all over that stuff. And that's all that's gone on with the Overland rig is gearheads got a hold of it. And then it became kind of an image thing. And all I'm saying is I'd love to have one, but y'all, you don't need one. You do not have to have one. If you've got a four-wheel drive and a tent or a hammock, you've got an Overland rig. Whatever you already use can function as that as long as it's four wheel drive. I think that's what I would call it by definition. Guys, if you weren't driving overland and needed to be say self-sufficient for the possible flat or getting stuck in the mud, this is called car camping. Like it's car camping out of a far four wheel drive. Like that's just the reality of it. That's all I'm trying to point out is that's the reality of it. There is a perceived image of what it is, but in reality, it's not really that at all, but they are cool. And I do like them. Um, moving on from overland rigs and vehicles, we've done overland rigs, we've done bicycles, we've done vehicles. Um, you know what, here's one because we are starting to push into our hour. So let's wrap up with a couple of last thoughts on them. Let's talk about photography real quick. Everyone's getting into photography and I'm probably going to say some offensive things here, but I don't mean to offend. I just mean to inform. Everyone's a photographer now or thinks they are everyone. And what is constituted according to um, what you see by appearance on Instagram to be a <laughs> appear to be a photographer is a four ninety nine subscription to Lightroom so that you can crank the HDR through the roof and editing, take a picture of a sunset and get a really cursive, pretty fancy watermark to put on it and make sure and put that watermark full opacity right in the center of the screen where you, okay. The subject matter is not what matters to a lot of folks these days. It appears it, it's more about them appearing to be a photographer and wanting the world to think they are. Um, you can tell the difference because watermarks are important. Don't get me wrong. Watermarks are important because people will yak your images. And if you take good images, people will yak them and they can go make money with them. They can use them in any way that shape or form. But here's the thing about a watermark. A lot of people are treating the watermark as a way to like, try to make an image look like I'm a professional photographer. When in reality, like you bought a camera, like I did, you took a picture of a sunset, which anyone can take because a sunset takes itself. If it's a really pretty sunset, you have to be really bad to screw it up. 
it takes itself. It's like being on the coast of California in the Big Sur area. You could look like a professional with a Kodak freaking throwaway disposable camera. You totally could. Um, And then crank the HDR up and then put it out there in the world. That's not what a watermark's for. A watermark's not meant to make you look like a professional photographer. A watermark is intended for you to be able to identify your photo in order to claim a copyright infringement on it. My watermarks say copyright uh, waywardstories.com. That's how I've copyrighted my stuff. If you look for it on a lot of my photos, what you will find is it's always in a lower corner. It's always got some amount of translucentness to it. I crank with the opacity because I don't want it to be the focus of my image. I don't need to look like a professional photographer. I'm just trying to share the beautiful things I see in the world through my eyes. That's what I want. I love to take photographs. I love to compose it. I love subject matter and I just want to show it to people. Look what I saw. Look how I see it. And yeah, I want it to look good because I am a creative person. So I learned to use Lightroom. I learned to use editing software and I try to make the best recreation of things exactly as I saw it. When you find my watermark, nine times out of 10, what you're going to find is it is nearly completely translucent. It barely stands out from the background that it's on. It's in one of the lower corners and the whole purpose of of it being there is so I can find it if somebody yaks one of my images, which has happened before, they don't even notice the watermark. That's more how a watermark's intended, unless you are a true professional photographer doing photos of families of people that you sell to the people and you don't want them to just be able to take all the time and effort you put in and go print it out off a printer, right? So you put watermarks right across the center of the picture. When you're doing landscape, When you're doing landscape and outdoor photography to share with your Instagram world where you're trying to build like your Insta base and and so you can become an influence or whatever these people are doing, you don't like that. You don't need a watermark right in the middle of the subject of your shot. Like that defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do, except for it doesn't because what it does is exposes what people are trying to do, which is create an image of themselves as a professional photographer. Um, I don't purport to be a professional photographer, nor do I want to be. I do not. I mean, I've had several. If you have a camera and you take pretty pictures of like the woods, everyone and their dog is going to come to you. Any of you photographers out here know this. They're going to come to you and say, hey, will you take pictures of my kid? Will you do my graduation pictures? Will you do our wedding pictures? I always have said no, because I am not a photographer in that sense. I could learn how to be, but I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in taking pictures of humans. It just I don't know. That's not what I want the medium for. I like the medium to capture what I've seen out there so I can come back and share it with other people. I'm just, it's not what I do. It's just not for me. So I'm not a professional photographer. I don't make money at it. I don't even think that I'm good enough to make money at it. My watermarks are simply because it is my image and I'm like sick of getting pushed around in the world. I want to be able to prove you shouldn't be using that. That is mine. But When it comes to photography, God, that just turned into a big soapbox rant and I just ran off everyone. But you know, it's how I feel. That's the freaking truth about it. If you got HDR, if you can crank the HDR to 11, take a picture of a sunset and put some cursive looking so-and-so photography on it, you know what? You do you, man. I am about that. But that right there is about trying to appear to be something. It's not about the image that's being taken because when your watermark is literally taken over as the subject matter of the image. Something's wrong there. If you're not doing it professionally for people to buy, then something's wrong there because the subject of your image should be the actual focal point of your image. Your subject should be that sunset, that waterfall, that butterfly, that stork, that crane, that whatever, that bird, that animal. That should be the subject, not like your watermark right across its face. Anyway, point is to get into photography, it's actually pretty cost effective. Like people think that you see some of these pictures, y'all, and I, I see pictures to this day and I'm like, good, what do they have and how are they doing it? Cause they are amazing. There's some amazing photographers out there. There are some incredible astrophotographers, landscape photographers, man, they are out there. But like your brain immediately thinks, God, how much money do they have in equipment? Oh my God. And it can be, it could be a crap ton of money in it. Absolutely. Like you get into really high res, high quality Canons, Nikons, 
on down the list. Yeah, you might be to looking at a $1,500 or $2,000 body without the $3,000 lens on it, just the body. You can look at that. But the reality is I've taken pictures that have been featured in calendars. I've taken pictures that were featured on the Arkansas State Parks website. I've taken pictures that have been featured in prominent places. And I did it with a $350 Canon T6. I just upgraded to a mirrorless camera. I'm still learning to use it because the T6 finally gave out because like I beat that thing to death. Like I treated it like a camera that a hiker would carry. I carried it all over the world. I dropped it in a creek in freaking California. Anyway, the point is that camera took incredible photos because I learned how to use it. Not because I paid $4,000 for it, because I learned how to actually take long exposure. I learned about exposure. I learned about aperture. I learned about all the little things that you need to know to take good photos. And what photos are about, guys, let, let me put it to you this way. Let me give you an example. Before the last 20 years, the most iconic photos that defined generations were taken on, obviously, film cameras, but if you looked at the resolution of a film camera at distance, like, guys, they're grainy photos. It wasn't about the clarity. It wasn't about the fine detail. It was about the moment and the subject that was being captured. Think of the JFK assassination. Think of Martin Luther King and some of the iconic photos of him. Those weren't taken on $3,000 Okay, well, they might have been $3,000 cameras back then and good lenses, but my point is they weren't taken with, you know, 28, 30, 35 megapixel cameras. Like, those didn't even exist. The best of some of those iconic old photos, the quality, the image quality is garbage compared to what you can do with your iPhone or your Android today. It's not about how much money you spend or the equipment you have. It's about the subject you're shooting, how you've composed it, what you're after, and what you're trying to show the world. Ansel Adams himself, if I, I won't get the quote right, but what I remember about him and learning about him, his whole goal in photography was to try to capture the way whatever he was taking a photo of made him feel in real life as he stood there. That was how he went after that photo and he learned how to use the medium. He was all about tonality, lights and darks. When he was, when he was photographing Yosemite to him, it felt crisp because the air there is crisp. It's cold. It's crisp. It's hard linear surfaces. It's freaking half dome. It's all of these things. It's El Cap. And he was trying to catch it starkly and sharply as he could with the equipment he had at the time. He wanted pinpoint sharpness. He wanted the tonalities. He wanted the black to play with the lights. He wanted it to show what it looked like and capture the feeling that it gave him. That's what photography was to Ansel Adams. And I think at its basis, that's what photography is to everyone who truly loves it as a medium. They're there to try to capture the subject that they are looking at because they want to share it in a certain way with the world. So my point is you don't have to have a thousand or $1,500 body with a 1500 or $2,000 lens to go out there and take good photos in general. Yeah. Like let's say you want to like photograph the rings of, you know, some of our planets out there in the solar system. Yeah. You're going to need some really expensive equipment to specifically make that happen, but that's different. That's not going out there to take pictures of creeks and wildlife. What you need is to learn how to use the settings. So even that there's a perceived paywall in my camera setup, my old one that all the photos I've ever had featured anywhere, or even had people offer to buy from me and have sold some prints of were taken on a Canon, like, T6 Rebel, literally what you buy at Best Buy, but I learned how to use it. Got a couple of little aftermarket lenses from freaking Amazon for like 20 bucks a piece. Circular polarizer is probably the most important one for me. And an ND filter, learn how to use it. And I'm into that camera. The tripod's as important as the camera almost, guys. Buy a good solid tripod. If you want sharp pictures, you got to have a good tripod. I have $100 in a tripod, like $380 in a camera, and $30 or $40 into lenses. And that was bought somewhat over time as I upgraded into things. I'm in under $500 taking pictures that people have bought and featured in magazines and calendars. Like, it's not about how much you spend. It's about finding what works getting the best quality you can and are willing to budget for and afford 
and making it work for you. And all it takes is research. It takes study, it takes learning, and it takes putting some effort into it. So I hope that that makes sense to you, what I'm saying about photography alone. There's a huge perception of what a true photographer is. No, nay, you don't need even a good watermark to put your picture on Instagram and share with people. All I suggest is learning how to use the editing tools properly because any camera comes out very unbalanced, especially if you don't understand over and under exposing. And you do probably need that editing software to bring the colors more back to what it looked like to you. They're richer to the naked eye. When you take the shot, a lot of times they come out really blown out. It just doesn't do it justice. And you try to bring some of the richness back to try to make it look like what you saw. That's how I, that's how I approach it. It's sort of an Ansel Adams approach, but not quite in the same vein. I'm just trying to simply show it to the best representation of how it looked to my eyes. And that can be tough. But the point is you don't have to have millions of dollars in equipment to get it done. You can get by on some pretty low budget stuff. And it's not about it's not about the perception. If you're looking at everything and all your information is coming from Facebook and all the Arkansas pictures and beautiful pictures of Oklahoma and, and Washington, whatever state you're in, they all have their own groups and you're on Instagram and you see that. Don't let that be a deterrent to you guys saying, I can't take pictures like that. Yeah, the heck you can. And that paywall is a perceived paywall. You can do it for a lot cheaper. Like I will say that. I'll challenge, I'll go right there with anyone on some of the pictures I've taken. I'll put it right next to pictures people have taken with multiple thousands of dollars worth of camera. And my image, it competes with it. It's right there next to it for way cheaper. My point is not to say, look at me. I'm a good photographer because I don't consider myself a good photographer. My point is you can do it. You can do it beyond that perceived paywall. You don't have to have all that money and all that equipment invested to be able to do it yourself. So like take that out of your mind and get back to the whole point of everything I wanted to say from the start. Go out, find yourself, be yourself, do your thing, man. Do your thing. You be you and do it without apology and don't worry about what other people think about it. Just get out there and do it, man. Just get out there and do it. Live your life. Find ways, pair this with the Explore More episode. Go back and listen to it, then come back to listen to this. And you've got a good idea how I see it. Y'all can get out there. There, I've, I've combated as best I can every possible objection you could have and excuse you could have for not getting outside and living your life. Well, guys, I think that that's going to about wrap up everything I wanted to talk about tonight. We ran over an hour, so we've got our hour episode here to go. We are back into our two week on two week off production schedule for the foreseeable future. We're back on topical subjects. If you've got any stories you want to tell us, guys, my wayward story at gmail.com. We are still looking for your submissions. Um, Please rate, review and subscribe again. It helps us out so much. If you'll just take one minute of your time to drop a star there on your podcast player of choice and let people know that you're enjoying it tell your friends share it with your facebook groups guys that's what significantly helps us grow um if you want to go and you need to you need to go subscribe on youtube guys got a lot of stuff over there like experience videos um don't have any unboxings but i have a lot of reviews i will only review stuff that i have used extensively and can give what i believe is a fair review on and i've got some reviews over there on gear that i've used for years um if you want to follow me on instagram if you want to check out anything, pictures, blogs, photo galleries, it's all at waywardstories.com. Um, guys, I appreciate you coming back. I'm having so much fun making this show, and I'm having a lot of fun interacting with those of you who are choosing to interact. I encourage more of you to do so. You know where to find me. I just gave you all the stats. And until we catch you on our next episode, I hope you guys will break down all these perceived walls, get yourself out there, live your life, and remember to be good to each other.